Hello, cinefans. I'm Kendall Krufer, and this is Watching Classic Movies. This episode, I went into a classic horror deep dive with my guest, Miguel Rodriguez, founder and director of the Horrible Imaginings Film Festival. While talking about some great films, we discussed how the style of horror as we know it emerged, when it transitioned from the classic era to the modern age, what makes a monster and how that has changed with the times, and how what scares us is so personal. We had a quick visit from Miguel's daughter, Scarlett, a budding film festival director. I hope you enjoy the way her happy three-year-old sounds enhanced the background of our conversation as much as I did. Welcome, Miguel. Thank you for joining me today. Oh, thanks for inviting me. I can't wait to talk to you about this. Now, you've done something remarkable that a lot of people are not able to pull off, and that is you've started a film festival, and it's run for over a decade now. How many years have you Yeah, done? we just wrapped our 12th year, so we started back in 2009. So the Horrible Imaginings Film Festival, tell me a little bit about what kinds of films that you show. You know, for lack of a better term, it's a horror genre film festival, but my definition of what that includes is so broad that I've actually changed, you know, we don't call ourselves necessarily a horror film festival. The word horror isn't in the name at all. Um, we're a film festival that focuses on cinema that expresses the emotions of fear or anxiety, and that can be done in a, in a variety of ways, including, you know, crossing genre lines that are typically uh, what is expected of an audience. We do have a very eclectic program every year. That uh, It's kind of all over the place. Well, one thing I really like about the festival, which I was able to participate last year because you were online, mm -hmm. was that, that uh, your deep respect for classics, yes. genre classics, and that you had multiple screenings that include those films. So one of the parts of our mission statement that our personal philosophy on why we think this genre is important uh, and what its potentials can be when they're uh, presented with thoughtfulness. And a big part of it is paying attention to the timeline, right? And, and so that's what we call repertory cinema comes. That is the classic films or a revisitation of films that have come before. The beautiful thing about horror is it's so, I think the word I'll use is egalitarian. As much as people want, or the expectation by the mainstream is that horror is this one thing, which typically is like half nude women running through the forest with a knife killer chasing them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of what it's evolved to be in, a, in the public consciousness largely. It's really widespread because ultimately it is an expression of things that scare us. It's part of storytelling as long as there have been stories to be recorded, has included, you know, some way to try to understand our own darker impulses or the world around us, tragedies that happens. I think it's important to keep the past in mind. And also when it comes to classic film, horror has always, the genre, and, and any genre really, but some of the, the less sophisticated typically, or, or the ones that can throw away their pretenses, you get a kind of a, a neater glimpse of what the zeitgeist was like because yeah. it's a little more on the people end of things. It's it, you, you don't really need people to talk in a mid-Atlantic accent and act all fancy in a lot of these horror movies. So you kind of get the uh, the blue collar side of of humanity. Genre is a kind of unpretentious way to talk about real lives, and maybe there's things that somebody might find unappealing in a drama say, mm -hmm. that would enter their mind in a genre film. Like you're having a good time, but you're also kind of getting a feeling of this other person's experience. That That's what I love about it. Yeah. Yeah. So typically and classically, one thing that genre storytelling has offered is a way to embed a subtext into something that's popular, is to get a message across and actually have an audience. 
mm -hmm. <laughs> as opposed to something that might be a message and you get three people watching it, it, it becomes so, you know, like a Twilight Zone. That is, is one way, certainly. Also, you know, genre, particularly horror, it's, it's taboo to start with. Mm -hmm. So you have more, an artist, therefore, has more freedom to be taboo. The expectation is that the next thing that comes out as time goes on, with horror especially, but really anything, you kind of want to top what came before. You have a inevitable like increase in what's permissible, just yeah. because the culture has become used to it, right? After Psycho in 1960, a whole like that opened floodgates for what people were trying to do. The world really changed after that cinematically, and that's just one very obvious example. But it, but it did change things. It changed the way people went to the movies too. Just when they actually entered the theater. Oh, sure. Like the whole notion that we have these days of being in the theater and making sure that you're super quiet and it's trying to reduce being rude and oh, let's... Hi, Scarlett. Do you um, like movies? Do you like to watch movies? <laughs> She's nodding. <laughs> say words because this is going to be audio. Okay, do you like movies? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let the record show my daughter's not... <laughs> there we go. So uh, the thing that I find interesting about classic horror is there's kind of almost a line. There's, mm. there's like when I have friends who are more into classic movies, they will ask me, is this okay for me? Is this safe for me? So there's the movie that you'll show TCM prime time and the movie that you'll show TCM after hours. What do you think is, is really important for somebody who's TCM prime time to see? Like what movies jump out? The thing about horror particularly is it is so personal that the answer to that is going to really depend on a person's baggage uh, on a person's experiences on, on their tastes in a very large way the exorcist is brought up as one of the scariest but it's not scary for everybody you know there are all, there are people who find it less scary depending on their religious upbringing and, and those kinds of things yes so, the religion is a big part of that in a lot of horror Big part of, oh yeah, religion is a big, particularly, so in the U.S., you know, it's largely Anglo-Saxon kind of either, either Roman Catholic or Protestant kind of religion, religious horror. The reason that you see Catholicism pop up a lot, even when the characters are Protestant, is because the, the, the Catholic church has the imagery, right? The yeah. Catholic church has that, that vibe. You know, oh, you're so right that the visuals, it has the visual yeah. and it's cinema. It goes way back to Dracula. So let's talk about Todd Browning's Dracula, 1931. Yeah. Jonathan Harker is given a crucifix at the beginning of the film to protect him against evil by one of the rural folks in Transylvania who know, who find out he's going to cross the Borgo Pass and go to Dracula's castle. He, ha he humors her, but... It's not explicitly stated in the film the way it's stated in the book. So if you read uh, Bram Stoker's novel, that scene happens, but you get an insight into Harker's thinking, which is, I shouldn't take this, it's idolatry. Yeah. Because Harker's British, he is uh, Protestant. There is this kind of new world, old world, quote unquote, civilized London, backwoods, Transylvania rural versus urban stuff going on mm -hmm. beyond just the the vampires uh and so all of that i find very interesting but protestant you know iconicism isn't quite as you know gothic so the gothic is a big part of classic or if you go before the atomic age of the 1950s where our fears suddenly shifted to something quite different a lot of it was based in the classic gothic tradition that you know has a literary reference that goes back you know centuries and so a lot of that can be very funny. i mean i have been aware as someone who is not brought up with religion of how different my reaction is to a movie with those elements you know as my friends who went to catholic school all through their childhood and so I think that your point about it being a personal experience beyond just what you can stomach is so true because you do have that cultural background. Like, what, where are you coming from? I just find that interesting, even with the Draculas, the Spanish language Dracula that they did after hours. In, in some respects, it's just a better film because they're like, well, look what you did all day. Let's learn from this. Yeah. So there's, there's that. 
but it does hit different just hearing it in a different language it does it does give you a different feeling it's that different perspective and that's a great example because you had a largely protestant and jewish cast and crew making todd browning's film yeah and a very clear catholic cast and crew making the spanish version you know again it is, you i absolutely agree the production is far superior it's not saying much. I, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna admit here. I think Todd Browning's Dracula is not Todd Browning's best film. And oh, it's, no. not, it's not especially good. Like the it's Bella, Bella Lugosi and Dwight Fry are so watchable that it, it yes. stands the test of time on, in that regard. And the production design of the castle itself yeah. is really nice, but um, it is a bit of a slog, you know, especially when. The same year The Mummy came out, and that's such a much better film. <laughs> it's interesting. It, I, I really do think it is the Draculas that mm -hmm. bring it home, that make it iconic, because it, it's absolutely true. I mean, I'm, I'm coming off having seen those films not too long ago, and there's just so much charisma to, the, to, to Karloff and the, and the Mummy, but it's also just a better story. And... Yes. And the production design, you know, I, I guess they're, they're pretty equal. You know, you've got Vera West doing the costumes for both and oh, yeah. making, you know, a distinctive style that goes across them. Now, this is what I find interesting about, you know, you have the question of like, are you Hammer or are you Universal? You know, that sort of thing, yeah. like where, where your mindset comes from. It's interesting with Universal, like it really isn't just about the monsters. There's so many different kinds of films under that banner. What stands out to you? Something that maybe people don't think a lot about because they are distracted by Dracula, Frankenstein, that kind of thing. That doesn't fall in the normal pantheon. My, my favorite is The Black Cat. The, ah. The Edgar Ulmer film with, uh, with uh, Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff. I think it's the most audacious of that era. And <laughs> it's, it's just an insane film. Very dark. and. Also very personal. You know, when you talk about horror being personal, there's a lot that Omer put from his own experience as an Eastern European emigre with a lot of the World War I references going on in that film. And, you know, loosely, when I say, you know, is it based on Poe's The Black Hat? Only by title, really. It's... it's yeah. Uh, but it's uh, and there is some violence committed against a feline uh, by by Bela Lugosi near the beginning, fear of cats. But when we talk about breaking taboos, that that has all kinds of taboos in it. You've got in a, in a true nineteen that one was nineteen thirty three, I believe, or nineteen thirty four, kind of like the end of the pre code era. I and mean, that's the other thing is these films, the whole universal monster idea came during the pre code era. A lot of concepts were were used that wouldn't have been poster just a little while later. Yes, but uh, this one especially has you know hints of necrophilia and hints of Satanism, and Ulmer uses a very kind of F.W. Murnau German expressionism in the, in the set design, and such a beautiful wild film. And he also uses a lot of classical music. You know, I think for a modern audience, this is why it can be so fun to watch classic films. I don't think a modern audience necessarily will discern um, classical music used in film versus what would have been contemporary orchestral score music at the time, like Max Steiner or something like that. It was kind of passe to use traditional classical music. So, yeah, Black Cat, it's just a great gothic, ghoulish film. And, and I, there are several things, you know, you've got... The body's lying in suspension there yeah. instead of the black mass. You are you are seeing the end of the pre-code era there. I do have a special fondness for pre-code horror. Yes. I mean, that probably started seeing freaks when I was in high school and just having mixed feelings about what was happening, just wondering wondering if it was exploitation or if it was celebration, just things like that. You know, I think freaks freaks was was maligned at the time. And I think it is Todd Browning's best film. I think it's much better than Dracula. <laughs> yeah. You know, Todd Browning ha had circus experience. This is something like, I, so it was cel it was celebration. It was exploitation. We're, we can't get over that either. Yeah. But um, it is without, it's very clear that the protagonists of the film 
are the folks working in the circus who mm -hmm. have, you know, a variety of different challenges that, uh, you know, are outside the norm, if you will. The, the titular freaks are the, are the heroes of the film. They're the ones that we relate to. They're the ones who have the best personalities. And yeah, yeah, it, it, it's it's an uncomfortable movie, but it's also like it's so good, it's so great. That, uh, and you honestly love those characters. Yes, that's that's what makes it sit right. Is that you love them and you admire them for what they're able to do with their limitations. There are lots of scenes too that go beyond kind of like the central story. You know, there's this yeah. scene with the uh, you know, you've got the lady who. She's the handler for, I'll use the terminology they use at the time, the pinheads. And they're they're just playing in a grove, you know, by where the circus is set up. And a couple of guys are walking through the forest and they're just townsfolk, but they're really rude and mean for no reason. And she's like, they're just children. They're just playing those things out here. You know, that that's a real experience. That, that's something that, uh, you know, if that was in the script and there was a writing room conversation for a, a major universal picture, Someone would say, "Ah, uh, can we cut this scene out?" It's like, no, that that's one of the personal scenes for Todd Browning. It's a great scene. It's not talked about as much as like the Google gobble one of us scene, you know. But I really love it. Yeah, those moments that capture life, but that also mm -hmm. kind of capture the timeless elements of life, because that's still something that you would encounter today. That kind of casual cruelty. It's casual cruelty, and also, you know, it lends context to what happens in the film because. There is a very real separation between people and the circus folk, you know, and that just, it just highlights and illustrates it so that when it seems, when you get the Google Gobble One of Us scene, this idea that, you know, we're insular, there's a reason that that happened. The realities of the world and the realities of society have kind of forced this separation yeah. and the the results at the end is from that. It's, it's actually a really sophisticated idea that ultimately the problems of freaks are, are systemic. The problems of freaks are rooted in something that goes beyond the individuals. Yes. Rather than, yeah. yeah. So I think that that's one of the things I really like about yeah. it. I think that is why it has stood the test of time, you know? And yeah. It has a, you know, is more recognized now for its quality than it was at the time. I do find Todd Browning really interesting as a director. He's willing to be very intense. Mm -hmm. I'm sure undoubtedly knowing that it's not going to be easy for him to get this vision out there. Another one, um, The Unknown, where he actually, you know, him and Joan Crawford in an early role, mm -hmm. and he's actually cutting off his arms please this woman because she's repulsed by men's arms. I mean, there's just so many deeply perverse things in there. And, you know, in, in a way, I wonder why that wasn't more controversial. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it, I think it, it's an interesting question because what makes a film controversial is not as cut and dried as you would think. And I will say, as far as Todd Browning goes, he was an outsider. And he put that in his films. I mean, this is yeah. the classic kid running away to join the circus story, which he yeah. did when he was 16. Uh, he was a contortionist. You know, he, he, he was one of the sideshows. Um, that is a very insightful thing to know about the director and, and creator of a film called Freaks, is he would have been one of them, you know, in real life. So that's, that's important to know. He definitely related to the outsider. He definitely related to, to the underdog and the people who did not fit in or have a place. But, you know, what makes things controversial? I, I, you know, the classic, we already mentioned Psycho, which came out the same year as a film called Peeping Tom by Michael Powell. Oh, now that's one to talk about. It's a fantastic film. I, I, I love it. And, you know, in a lot of ways, they are similar films. You've got homicidal maniacs who are by all outward appearances, kind of like awkward, shy, charming young guys who unfortunately have a proclivity for losing their minds and, and killing young women. Peeping Tom was lambasted and hugely controversial and destroyed the career of Michael Powell. And we have to remember, this is the guy who is one of the archers. He worked with Pressburger, making some of the most celebrated films of all time, like The Red Shoes and Black Narcissus. Um, 
life and times of Colonel Flamp, you know, a million life and death. It's really, really celebrated director met his career's end with this film called Keeping Tom. And then Hitchcock, another British director, makes virtually a very similar picture of the same year and changes cinema forever. And so there are lots of ideas as to why this this dichotomy happened. You know, one of the most common things that's said is like, well, Hitchcock did see what happened to Michael Powell. Psycho came out later and he didn't screen for critics. And this is true. He didn't screen Psycho for critics. The critics were the audience. That was very on purpose. You know, that was part of the whole uh, mystique about make sure you're not late to the theater. You won't be let in. You're quiet. All that stuff that we have now kind of embedded into our movie going culture is because of Hitchcock and Psycho. I do believe he learned a real lesson Mm -hmm. from what happened to Peeping Tom. You know, I'm sure that 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 can't be the only reason for such a drastic difference difference in treatment. I think Peeping Tom's a great film. It's a very different film from Psycho. I know personally, I I do think it's an excellent film. Yeah. The way that it evokes fear and kind of disgust. I think for me, it's the prolonged horror Mm -hmm. of the women. Yeah. And that it isn't just, I was going to say that it isn't just this one off, but actually you can be led to understand that in Psycho, it isn't one off because he knows exactly what to do with that body. Yeah. But um, the fact that he's reflecting their horror and, and prolonging it and intensifying it. That's what gets in my guts. Mm-hmm. That's why I can't just sit down and randomly watch that film. I kind of have to like, I can prepare <laughs> myself. Whereas Psycho, it isn't any less disturbing if you think about it. But there's something about the cinematic style of it that that flows through. And yeah, that's a really interesting thing about uh, different visions and, and perspectives, I think. Yeah, you know, I wonder, you know, so in both movies, you've got the the lead character, and this is the other thing, you know, the protagonist in both films is the killer, but, you know, um, usually by himself. And, and both things are very kind of morbid and, yeah. and macabre, but I do think in Peeping Tom, it's more overt, right? Because you know that the images on that celluloid are basically snuff films. Whereas in, in Psycho, uh, you've got uh, the the avatar death of the animals. And yeah. The, their preservation by Norman Bates. I mean, Have you ever read Bo- Block, Robert Block's story? Yeah. It's so different because Norman in the book yeah. is not adorable. He really makes your skin crawl. And you know a little bit about his, about his habits. That you also get a really deep exploration of his of his misogyny you know his unfortunately like just as in the film the protagonist of the book is norman bates the book by the way for anyone listening is almost identical to the film when it comes to plot and story yeah and it's, scenes it's character it's the character that's different it's the character specifically of norman who is different and that includes his physicality he's a large kind of sweaty Pasty. <laughs> yeah, pasty, gross dude living alone. It's a very different thing. Oh, and he's a drunk. So it's a, it's such a different experience than you get from sweet Anthony Perkins. I mean, I think the difference is that Anthony Perkins seems like he's in Arrested Development. In the book, it's more that he's this blind adult. Yeah. There's ways that he hasn't grown up, but for the most part, he's just taking all the vices of adulthood and running with them where it's like you don't see any of that in the movie so you you're almost more sympathetic because he just seems like a child who's gone wrong you don't give him the agency or responsibility of adulthood so funny because you know hitchcock himself said block's book is just the film but that is a pretty significant difference (laughs) it really is in, in how you experience that story it really did change because after that it did change if you look at films after that well, let's take let's take a bird's eye view real quick. All right. So, yeah. why was horror so big in pre-code? Well, first of all, we had the Great Depression. Ultimately, this is what kickstarts that pre-code era because Hollywood's falling apart. Everything's falling apart, money-wise, financially. And in order to get people to buy tickets, you have to really entice them. Horror did that, you know, in a very real way. And it's not the first time. It's actually happening right now in the middle of the pandemic. You, you're getting all these think pieces about how horror movies are saving cinema, which is 
very true. Like the biggest sellers right now are Home by Post and Candyman, and those, those are those are the things saving cinema now. Yeah, and it's yeah. so funny. I've been on, I've been on panels. People talk about that. I was like, God, this is old news. The Universal Horror, Dracula and Frankenstein and the Mummy, they saved cinema yeah. too. This is what happened. There was sex and there was violence and there was vice and there were monsters. And it was undeniable that they were hugely successful. Dracula was the first of that particular lot uh, of the post um, talkie era. You know, a lot of people go back to Hunchback Notre Dame, Phantom of the Opera, uh, from the silence. But, uh, but yeah, Dracula is definitely like the number one. And then Frankenstein, and The Mummy, Invisible Man, those mm-hmm. first 30, the uh, early 1930s films. Because, you know, The Wolfman didn't come out to the 40s. And then, of course, the, the last of those was uh, Creature from Black Lagoon, of that first little group. And then you've got Bride of Frankenstein, who, for Elsa Lanchester's, only gets to show up for like five minutes. <laughs> and she steals but, everything. <laughs> yeah, she's, it's such an in- intoxicating five minutes. Yeah. That that look has become iconic, you know, like, uh, this is how you know it's iconic, you know, you still go to Spirit Halloween or Target in October, and if you see a Dracula costume, it doesn't look like uh, Gary Oldman, right? Yeah. It doesn't look like Frank Langella, it looks like Bella Lugosi. Yeah. If you see a Bride of Frankenstein costume, it looks like Elsa Lanchester. Yeah, you had horror before that, but it hit its stride. And, and found its touchstones and that, yes, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I hadn't really thought about that, but it's true. Like, what is your Frankenstein? Your Frankenstein has the bolts in the neck and mm-hmm. the square head. You know, it isn't, it isn't Robert De Niro. Is that who it was? Yeah. It's, it's, De it's Niro, those, yeah. Yep, it's not those yep. things. Those things are interesting to me. Or Christopher like Lee. Things. Yeah. Oh, you brought up earlier, like, am I a universal person or a hammer person? You know, yeah. Christopher Lee played Mummy. Christopher Lee, Lee played Dracula. Christopher Lee played Frankenstein. And Christopher yes. Frankenstein. Or Frankenstein's monster, I should say. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but but the iconicism is Carlisle. It's undeniable. Yes. It's undeniable. Christopher Lee's Frankenstein's monster is great. But. It's not that he's less. Christopher Lee can't be less. <laughs> but but mm-hmm. it is but it is just a different thing. It's it's a cultural shorthand and that is universal. Yeah. I see what you did there with Universal. That was a uh, little bit uh, of a double uh, meaning. But, uh, you know, it's up. really important to to note, so that horror, as we know it, started with that pre-code era with, like, opening the eyes of the financiers that this is a cat out yeah. uh, at a time when everybody was struggling. It grew up part and parcel with cinema. Horror has been there since Melier, since the late 1800s, when you first had zoetropes and Nickelodeons. There are always scary images. You know, it's always part of it. But for it to be like a powerhouse was definitely that. And to maintain that power, you know, Lemley, Carl Lemley, owner of Universal, and then he later had uh, his family take over, especially Carl Lemley Jr. You know, Jr. wanted to move away from horror all the time. And always ended up having to get pulled back because it was just keeping the company solvent, you know? Yeah, you know, like, they did keep trying to chug along with the same kind of movies for a little too long. And yeah. that's why what ended up saving monsters was things like Abbott and Costello. Mm-hmm. Like, all right, well, we'll use Abbott and Costello. And, and they made several films because those films, A, were fantastic. And B, did really well. But I mean, uh, the variation, sure. The variation. But I yeah. mean, like, the real kind of adrenaline to the heart was the atomic age gothic didn't do it for people anymore what were people afraid of in the 50s it was it was the bomb it was the the mystery surrounding radiation it was fire raid drills and duck and cover and (laughs) the russians you know it was the outsiders and so it's not the spooks anymore it's not the spooks anymore the gothic castles turn into spaceships the outsider if you have the original thing from another world. It's a very patriotic film, that first one. It really is us against them. That invasion of the body snatchers. That's the kind of stuff that you get that kind of jives and puts some adrenaline into horror at that point. Actually, in both of the examples, Think from Another World and Invasion of the Body Snatchers, they both got remade, you know, invasion remade many times. But um the good remakes are akin to the world that created. The difference between the uh, Hawks 
Thief from Another World and, and John Carpenter's The Thing in the 80s, they're both based on that short story, Who Goes There? John Carpenter's is closer to the short story, but to see them both together is great because they hint at this is what we were like at the time. <laughs> Whereas the, 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 the one from the 50s is very much let's bound together to beat these outsiders, keep watching the skies. John Carpenter's is the exact opposite. You know, we, we become paranoid of each other. That's a very, very interesting difference between the two. And that's where remakes can be interesting. It's where you, it's not just like a cat. Most remakes are just a cash cow. Let's cash in on something familiar. But if the creator does something interesting with it, like how do we rethink this? How do we reimagine this and reinvent it and make it more a reflection of our time now? Then I love it. Like uh, the uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers was remade in the 70s. Uh, yeah, I, I like that equally well to the original. So it's interesting companions. Yeah, well, you know, in the Invasion of the Body Snatchers, you keep, there's a lot of parallels between that and the Red Scare. Whether or not that was intended has been debatable, but it's certainly there. Author's intent only goes so far. Yeah. <laughs> you have to make it appeal to what people are afraid of. And certainly the idea of communism coming into our country and making us all mindless zombies was a thing what was something people were afraid of as much as i do like invasion of the body snatchers with kevin mccarthy i tend to prefer the 70s one with donald sutherland and you've got my personal favorite uh leonard des Moines <laughs> playing a psychologist and kind of like this new age psychologist and yeah. he's kind of one of the more devious characters what's frightening in that film is really different than in the other film and it's reflection of you know what was going on in the 70s which i really enjoy it's, it's a meteor awesome. story yes it is it's, yes. And, and the characters are the the that cast it's just those, those are people you want to look mm -hmm. at like veronica cartwright she she makes you feel with her i wish i wish you could get more veronica cartwright discussions because especially in horror veronica cartwright or Car the cartwrights in general uh are just so embedded <laughs> In the yeah. genre, you know, from you know the birds to to, to invasion of the body snatchers to alien, it's, it's fantastic. Which is a Vswick, even. Oh my gosh, yes, which is a Vswick. Yeah, I, yeah. There's so, something about her that that is so tapped into to vulnerability. Mm -hmm. that, big eyes. Yeah, that that I, I wonder why she hasn't been celebrated more as an icon. I, I think she's right up there with Jamie Lee, as far as I'm concerned. I agree. I agree. Let's give Veronica her due. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, she does end up just screaming a lot. I, I, you know, that's that's what puts her apart from from the Jamie Lee Curtises or the Sigourney Weavers. But, yeah. Uh, who cares? She's still awesome. <laughs> well, we brought it up to the present then. I mean, we could go on forever, Miguel. I know. Not, <laughs> we're probably, no. Honestly, we have to have a part two. To our, <laughs> what we're getting to here. But. If I was going to sum up the, this kind of sporadic conversation, we... In my, in my view, in my very sincere view, genre storytelling provides a cultural timeline to the way we interact with each other, the things we're afraid of, the things that we see. This is why, like, whenever I, I get involved in these horror discussions all the time because of what I do, and I get a little bit bored because it's always the same, like, 1980s Freddy Krueger's kind of stuff. There was movies before this time, you know, and it's it's really important to pay attention to them and how it follows a progression of our socio-political and interpersonal experiences. And that that's what I love about horror. It's it's a very much not an intellectual genre. It is an emotional genre. It is a, a genre of the emotion and in a way that can be very sincere. You know, it can be very real. And that's what I like about it. And I really appreciate how you've used your considerable platform to let people know about these films and, and to keep that history alive. I think it's vital to the survival of cinema. I 100% believe it's true. Yeah. You know, I think there is a contradictory thing with film in the age of streaming, which is a lot of this stuff is more accessible than it's ever been. Yeah. But so is everything else. And without advocates for classic cinema, it can fall in the hindsight. Like how many classic films are on Netflix? Not very many, right? Not very Close many. Zero. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I suspect your experiences might 
mirror mine a little bit, which is the reason I know so many classic films, aside from just being obsessed with watching movies and being a, growing up in a family who also was obsessed with watching movies, is growing up with three channels and you watch what was on. Yep, you know, yep. that was part of it for, for you taped me. It. You taped it and kept it and watched it over and over. Darn right. You yep. know, you, that's how I know not just horror classic films, but how I know, you know, Golden Age of Hollywood musicals and film noir and Cagney as a, uh, as a gangster and all this stuff. Happy I've always you. viewed it as a, as looking through a window into another world. And I feel like it's there, but there is so much else, especially with yes. all the series and binge watching. And, uh, yeah. You know, it makes it hard, but yes, I do want to advocate for it. And at least, you know, if we can talk about it as a timeline, then mm -hmm. it's, I think it can feel less overwhelming. Having it all together. I yeah. think that's absolutely true. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking to me about this today. I think it would actually help me to work out some thoughts. And <laughs> very I look forward to part discussion. 14. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Rico. Bye-bye, Kendall. For show notes, including how to follow Miguel online and more information about the Horrible Imaginings Film Festival, go to watchingclassicmovies.com. Thank you for listening. This is Kendall Kruver, watching classic movies. Until next time.